I hear you, John. All right. Good deal. Just let me know when we're ready, Jason. Fantastic. I'm going to preface this presentation with please, please, please ask questions. If you have any idea or questions about what I'm talking about or that might pertain to what I'm talking about, please feel free to ask. I will go more in depth to, to the best of my knowledge. I will cover as much as I humanly can. I have Twitch chat open over here. I'm ready for questions at any point in time. So we're going to start with a basic who am I slide. Again, I'm just going to hit the important parts that are relevant to this presentation. I'm Red Team Chief. I do tool development, I like networking, and I'm a diver. I talk about a lot, that's why it's relevant. All right, the agenda. So what are we gonna talk about today? So we're gonna talk about where does red teaming come into play? Where does it start? Where, where in the attack kill chain does it actually begin? What is a red team infrastructure? What does all that entail? Coming from command and control servers to team servers, the agents, implants, bots, uh, there's a bajillion and a half names for them. Uh, transports, different transports for all these bots, droppers and stagers. How do we actually get that malware on the system? What does that entail? Uh, how does all this link together after we learned about all this stuff? How does all that come to fruition at the end? Uh, and then can I get a job in this? We'll talk about all that. So where does it come into play? <clears throat> this is the MITRE ATT&CK kill chain. Uh, I Googled a picture of it. The second half is the main portion of what at least RIT sec red team does. Uh, there are red teams that do the entire kill chain. We really only handle the second half. And that's what I'm really going to be talking about because it's based off the infrastructure for this talk. So we start with, we have to deliver the malware. We have to deliver that, that our malware, our implants onto the target system. And I'm going to refer to the target system as the victim, the blue teamer, the, the, whoever you're trying to attack with, with your, with your like uh, engagement here. So the target system, we need to find a way to deliver that malware to there. And we'll be talking about that. And we then need to either exploit it uh, in some way to actually get the malware to run because we can't deliver it without an exploit or a vulnerability. Uh, Twitch chat said, what's a team server. We'll get to that. There's a whole slide on it. So once we exploit, either with like uh, say eternal blue is an exploit or maybe the exploit that Enzo was just talking about earlier in the news section, or even in competition, we have, we have compromised accounts. So in that case, it's a compromised account. Uh, so we actually can now take control by exploiting these vulnerabilities. And once we exploit these vulnerabilities, we now have control over the system. Now we want to execute our stagers or droppers or malware, depending on what you're doing in that kill chain. And then once you execute it, you want to maintain your presence on the device. You want to persist on the device. And then from there, you can do the rest of the red team um, engagement. And we're going to talk about that after we go over a bunch of the vocab and what the hell is all of this stuff I just said in the first slide in the agenda. So here's a brief overview of what we're going to be looking at. I'm going to reference this overview a lot. This is a very basic topology I made. Uh, there can be, it can be made very many, it can many different ways. You can have one, just a target machine is involved in all of these. You, uh, you can have one C2 and that's it. You can have two C2s and a team server. You can have a one C2 and one team server. You can do a lot here, but I'm just going to stick with this basic one because this allows us to have two, three command and controls. And that's really good to go over a bunch of different examples I have uh, that communicate to a target machine. And then that team server is going to communicate with those C2s. And we're going to get into what are all of these right now. So let's start with command and control. I think this is a good, really good starting point. So that's that middle layer. That was the three command and control servers. I'm going to reference them as C2s. This is the common shortening for them. So what the hell is it? Uh, this is what the target computers, act, target computers actually communicate with. This is what the machines that you've compromised actually communicate with. So they sit there and they listen. They listen for heartbeats. You can send commands to the target machines with these. You can receive data or any output from the commands to these. And they talk to the team servers. So what does all that communication mean? Uh, this is where, these are where you tell 
the target machine to do something. You want to run a command on that target machine. Say you want to run a who am I to see what level access you are. You run a who am I and the C2 will say, okay, we're going to run who am I. And it sends it down to that target machine. And then that target machine will run your implant or your malware that you have on there. And then say your malware is coded to send back the output from that. You'll get the output back and you'll see it on the command and control server. In some cases, it'll send it up to the team server. And we'll talk about those on the next slide. Also, the heartbeats are really important of what these do. A lot of the times malware will, uh, what we call beacon out and beaconing is when the malware actually, or the, the implant talks to the command and control server without actually needing to run a command. It'll just give it a nice check-in. Uh, like a, hey, how are you? I'm still alive type of thing. It could be any kind of uh, network traffic at all just to know that the malware is still on the system and can still communicate to the command and control. And this is really key to keep organization to your whole red team infrastructure. Uh, it's very similar to what botnets do. They call out to that server. Uh, so now going on to team servers. Uh, I have a picture of Cobalt Strike right there. Very, very popular and very widely used team server in the industry. Uh, so team server helps track and communicate all the C2s. It collects all information from the C2s. It organizes the C2s. It keeps track of all the infected machines that the C2s are talking to. And it's going to send commands to the C2s. And you can also schedule tasks normally in more popular um, team servers to run on machines at certain times, meeting certain expectations, or you can group machines in, in groupings. These groupings will be whatever you can set up, or you can have it be anything at this section of IP addresses. Do run this command at this time. Um, the, the big thing about team servers is that you do not directly communicate from the target machine to the team servers. The team server is way up there on the topology. You can proxy, you can have C2s in between C2s to get to the team server, but you do not want your target machine to even know your team server exists. That's what a lot of botnets do as well. They do not want to ever talk to the bot, the bot hoarder, like the actual person running the botnet does not ever, ever, ever want to talk to its low level like grunt machines that are doing all the work because that is the easiest way to get caught. If, you're, if your client or target machine talks to the team server, this is a really good way for it to get caught and then it'll be blocked and you will be, have no access to the machine anymore. Uh, and then you don't have persistence, which is what we're going for. Is that clear on the team server? Anyone have any questions on the team server before we move on, Twitch or anything? I'm going to give it a minute because there's a delay. All right, if anyone has questions, feel free to just drop and I'll answer them. So now I've been talked saying implants, bots, malware, what, what is all that? This is, these are terms used throughout the security community. I've heard a lot of these terms. I've heard people use them interchangeably. They do mean different things and to some people. Uh, I'm not ex extremely clear on what exactly is specified as what. I just know these are interchanged so much. Uh, so this is pretty much a nice universal term. It, it's your malware on the system. It's what you're running on the system that is malicious. Um, so this is what calls out to those C2s. So you, this is what I'm going to refer to a lot as implants because that's what I, I say a lot. These implants call out to your C2 and actually communicate with it. They run commands. They send heartbeats. They do all of that. So now I have shells on here. This is what has shells for them. What is a shell? Well, shell, there's two types of shells specifically that I want to go over in malware specifically. Uh, there are bind shells, which is where your laptop or your, your target machine opens a port and it's listening. It's waiting for a connection to be made to it. So that is when you make a connection to that machine. So a bind shell, for example, would be say you're the SSH D like the actual service SSH. That would be a bind shell. Actually, you have to make it. I, the malicious attacker have to make a connection to that machine in order to do something. And then I cut the connection off and then there's a reverse shell. So what a reverse shell is, is when I have the server and that target machine makes a connection to me, you see this a lot more. And this is what you'll see a lot of the times. Uh, I'm not going to get too much in the firewalls unless someone wants me to. But when a lot of firewalls, if they allow a connection outbound, it's normally allowed inbound. Uh, yes, Dan, SSH is Red Team's favorite bind shell. 
Uh, when you when you allow connection uh, outbound, it has allowed back inbound. So that will allow for a full communication and it's pretty reliable. Uh, what else can your malware do? Well, other than just run commands as a very high level privileged user, it can install back doors. Uh, if you want to get really fancy, you can find a privesque. Um, and also what we do in competitions, we use it to mess with blue teams a lot. If you ever do a blue team competition with us or UB or anything, there is a lot of different memes we have built up over the years that we can mess with your computers. Uh, does anyone have questions about implants, bots, et cetera, any of this? Fantastic. So now droppers and stagers. A lot of people say, okay, well, how the hell do I get the malware on the system? Okay, well, your dropper stager is something you code to install the implants. Uh, this dropper stager is a script or an executable or a binary file, any of the sort. It just has to install your implant for you. It can change a bunch of settings for you. It can do time stopping if you're unfamiliar with that. It's just changing the time, system time on the file that you have on there to match other system files, kind of a way to hide hide the modified files. You can copy a binary that's saved inside of it. So for clarification, what that means is you say you have a .exe file. You can actually save all the bytes of another .exe file inside of your .exe file. And then you can tell your, the one that you're running, the dropper, to copy the .exe file out of itself and put it in somewhere else on the system to run. So this, the, the downside to this is that you can get some possibly really big executables. And when you're doing malware, you really don't want to have some huge giant executable. The alternative for this is you can have it pull it down from a server. So your dropper will call down from a download server somewhere, like a, a sort of CDN. So you'll be hosting your file, say up on the cloud somewhere. And then your dropper will be like, give me that file real quick and it will download it. And then it will run it. So this is another really popular means of doing this. Uh, you'll see this. This is a, this is what you'll see out in the wild a lot, uh, from what I've seen. Okay, cool. So now we have the implants. We got we got the way it talks to the C2s. We got the team server. So how does it actually? What goes on with that communication between the C2 and the actual implant? So. Yes, let me take a drink of water real quick. So what is a transport? Uh, we describe uh, in Red Team, uh, at least in our IT sec, we describe transports as that communication between that bot and the C2. So this is the way that it communicates with the C2. And there's so many different ways to communicate. Uh, you can communicate to C2s in literally any protocol that's available, or you can make your own protocol with a raw socket, but Simon has a whole talk on raw sockets. Go check that out on the channel, the YouTube channel, if you want to see that. He does a fantastic job explaining that. But we can build commands into literally any protocol that exists. Uh, a lot of the times you'll see HTTP and HTTPS for encrypted traffic. Uh, you can literally send an actual like HTTP header, like a web request to the C2 that's running. And the C2 will know, okay, I got a web request. Let's look at the data section. Okay, the data section has a command that says, run who am I? And then it will run the who am I, and then it will talk back. So you can literally transfer data between the two server, the server and the, and the target machine through web requests. You can do it through DNS. DNS has open packets you can talk through. You can do ICMP, mail. You can do, you can talk through mail, the SMTP protocol. There's ways to send data between there. Uh, just a basic TCP or UDP socket. You can do uh, one of my bot or... Yeah, one of my bots has a UDP socket that just runs and it just takes commands. Sometimes it'll talk out. So that's a one way to do it. And you can even write your full, like a raw socket, like a full protocol from the kernel up. Like it doesn't even touch the firewall, which is a really good way to talk. Um, all this can be monitored though. This is, this is the problem now. So now we have all this traffic going through and it can be monitored. So how the hell do we hide all this? Because this, this could be a lot of traffic going through. They can see everything we're doing. Uh, so I'm going to take a second for questions as I take another drink of water and then we'll get into hiding. All righty. So no questions. So as a red teamer, I don't want you to know what I'm doing. I want to stay hidden. 
So what am I going to do? We can start with some very basic encryption, or we can even just like base 64 our commands that we're running. Uh, this will obfuscate it and not make it as obvious. Uh, is this the most effective means? No, but there you have to use a combination of everything to really be effective. Um, you can use other infected computers for C2s. So for example, say I have infected Enzo's computer and I have my, my laptop over here that I want to talk to and I have my other C2 and then a team server. So I can tell my team server, hey, send a command to John's laptop. So it will tell my C2, hey, tell Enzo, the other C2, like a proxy, tell John's laptop this. And then my C2 will tell Enzo's computer to tell my laptop to run it. And then my laptop will talk back to Enzo's machine and then Enzo's machine will talk back to my C2 and then up to my team server. So that's a really good way of hiding even more because now I, my, my laptop that I have does not even see my C2 server. It goes through Enzo's machine and maybe Enzo's machine is on the network and it's supposed to be talking to there anyway. So now you have more hidden traffic that way. Uh, also, not ex ex um, sending extreme amounts of traffic out is another really good way to stay hidden. In the real world, you will not communicate constantly to computers a lot of the times because that is very obvious in, through like network monitoring software. In competitions, we will absolutely blow up your network. If you pull out Wireshark, you will catch our beacons. I guarantee you. For competitions, pull out Wireshark or TCP dump. You will see our beacons. They are there. We do not hide in competitions. Please use it. I have, I very rarely do people pull out Wireshark. Uh, you can hide in other protocols. As for mentioned, you can. It's really sneaky if you hide in like DNS or actual traffic or HTTP. Sometimes it you're browsing the web. It looks like web traffic. Sometimes it's hard to tell. Uh, you can really get sneaky with Stego. I'm not an expert on Stego. You can hide your actual commands and images, files, and other pictures. It, it, that gets really complicated. Uh, there's a whole class on that, I believe, at RIT. Uh, and then there's some way more advanced techniques that I don't even begin to touch located here at attackmiter.org. They have a lot of really good stuff there. Okay, so now we talked about all this. How the hell does it all come together? All right, so now back to the kill chain again. We need to deploy our implants using our stagers and droppers. Uh, how you actually get on there would need an exploit or a compromised account or some other means of getting on the computer. But once we're on there, we have control and we can run our dropper or our stager. The stager will then allow us to have access. And now we wait. Now we sit back and wait once we run this and wait for it to check into our command and control servers. Once we see that the green light, hey, they're checking in, we have access. We can now use the team server to give some commands. And now what do we do? We build more backdoors, we extract important and sensitive information that we want, or, and we cover our tracks. In competition, we don't cover our tracks, but in the real world, you want to cover your tracks. You want to make sure that they didn't even know you were there. At the end, shut the whole thing down, doesn't matter. So you might say, John, all this is really fantastic. I don't know where to start. Can I even do this as a job? Can I make money from this? Absolutely. There are absolutely tons and tons and tons of companies that do this and pay you money to do this stuff. It's so much fun. I don't know why more people don't do it. Uh, here are some companies I know that do it off the top of my head. There are so many companies that do this kind of stuff. You just really need to look for it. There's so many companies that have dev jobs and code and build all this infrastructure out. So another question you might ask is, okay, I want to do this, but what skills does it take? And even what skills do I get out of it? Heavy, 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 heavy research. This kind of thinking and this kind of tooling and building all this stuff out takes a lot of research and creativity. You have to think outside the box. You have to understand how stuff works. This, a lot of this stuff isn't going to be a quick Google search. Oh, I did it. Like, oh, let's check Stack the Overflow article on how to do this. You're really going to have to actually think about how the code works and piece it together and figure out and read man pages and read docs and figure out how all this code works. You're then also going to probably get a really good understanding of the operating system you're working with, devices that you're working with, or protocols that you're working with. Excuse me. When doing this, you're probably going to have to get a really deep understanding with research of whatever you need to do for the operating system to actually work with your implant, how it's going to talk back to your C2, and all the devices that are involved in between that process. 
you're going to get a pretty good background in coding. I know a lot of people don't like coding. You don't need coding for this. There's pre-built ones, but if you really want to make your own, you're going to at least need a basic understanding of coding. Coding comes with practice, in my opinion. It's a way of thinking. You'll get the hang of it the more you practice. So you're going to have to code a lot of this stuff to make it your own and maybe even evade detection. Uh, one second. You're also going to need to do a lot of DevOps and networking. The way all these like, team servers and uh, C2s talk to each other, uh, you're going to have to do no networking and you're going to have to know how to set things up. So those are all pretty important. Uh, I have something I forgot to mention that I'll talk about if no one has any questions, though. I'm going to give it a second for questions, though. Please ask questions if you have any question at all. There are no stupid questions. This is meant to make sure everyone has a good basis of what the hell Red Team is. Yeah, Enzo. Perfect. This is a great, a great question. <clears throat> so now you're thinking about all this and you want to, you want to think, how do I get involved or how do I do this? How, wh how much time do am I going to need to dedicate to this? It really depends on a bunch of different things. It depends on your skill level, how what good you are at researching. How are you using technologies? You know, you don't know, which are you going to actually be doing for this? And I can give a really unhelpful answer and then I'll explain it. This could take you anywhere between, I'd say, like five hours to like a year, uh, depending on the project you want and the scope that you're actually working with. So with that being said, say I, I'm a new person and I just got in here, but I know coding. Say I know Python really well and I want to write some Linux malware and I can write Linux malware in Python and I can write C2s in Python. So I'm sitting here and I know kind of know how networking works. Okay. So these are all some, some basic things. I have a little bit of an understanding. Uh, if you pick a basic project with a smaller scope, say I want to write something really simple. I want to write a Linux service. Okay, I can Google that. I want my Linux service to write com run commands. I can figure out how, how to do that. I want it to connect with a socket to my C2 and talk back and forth a little bit. <clears throat> Sockets are unreliable. Maybe not the best way, but you're starting out. Why not? It's a way to do it. <clears throat> so something like that might take you, say, two weeks to a month because you have a decent understanding and it's a more of a smaller scope project. Or you can say, okay, I want to write some C2s. I want these C2s to be able to do all this. Maybe I want to add a team server to that. I want my malware to talk to my C2s. One C2 has like one protocol and the other C2 has a different protocol I want to use, depending on if the one can actually reach, like if my malware can reach the one C2, if it can't, maybe talk to the other one, a different protocol. Something like that could take up to like a year, depending on what technologies you're using. So it really depends on the scope of the project. And my suggestion for anyone starting is scope your projects small and you can always build up off them. It's understanding the concepts of what's going on. If I build that small, like mediocre C2 at first, I explained in Python, I can take those techniques and translate them to another language or translate those techniques to other languages, coding, or even maybe make, make a new C2 that my current like implant talks to the same way. So it really depends. Good question. Anyone got any other questions? How any of the stuff works? I'm gonna ask for some participation here if I don't get another question and then I'll be done. I'll stop yamming in your ear about red team. Alrighty. So does anyone know what's a good way? Um, I think a good way to word this. So say I have the three C2 servers we looked at. Dan asked a question, what kind of tools does the red team need more of? Red team needs more of everything. The red team always needs more of everything. If you can write red team tools or you want to write red team tools, we need you because it's about passion and wanting to do it and learning. I don't care if you write some meme stuff that pops some stuff up on their desktop or write stuff in a terminal. If you want to try something, it is all worth it. You will can build off of it and you learn from it. There needs to be a variety, in, at least in competitions, we run from, we run, we want low level tools that actually are like really hard to catch. And we want some high level stuff where people are like, oh, I see it. It's right there. That really big variant makes the competitions fun and provides a lot of skill level for 
red teamers and blue teamers because everyone gets to practice at varying skill levels. Good question, Dan. All right, I'm going to go back real quick to the one thing I was saying, and then I will be done unless there's more questions. So we have three C2 servers like we have. Does anyone know a good way to, to communicate with those C2 servers and avoid getting blocked or get, get around getting blocked? Did anyone have any idea? I can pull the Discord up. Um. So, uh, from Discord, what's the difference between red teaming and pen testing? And have you heard about red team? Yes, Jason, I have in fact heard about red team. Um, as for the difference between red teaming and pen testing, this is a controversial point in the uh, security community. So I'm not going to dig in too much on it, but I can share my opinion. My opinion is red teaming is more uh, that second portion that I talked about. And actually the exploitation part and staying in there and maintaining and exfiltrating data. Whereas the pen testing is the full entire life cycle, finding the way to get in, getting in, handling it all. Maybe not so much using custom tools, but using tools that are out there to, to like test a person's system. Whereas red teaming is actually making your own stuff in my opinion, but that's controversial. That's what I think of it. So that's just how it is. And then Jason also asks, so is a team server almost like a C2 for C2s? Uh, yeah, that's pretty much what it is. It's it's a C2 for C2s at that point. Uh, yeah. Uh, they call it team server because it manages all the C2s. That's kind of the I idea behind it, I believe, for the name. Mm. Dan is making an important note about uh, the difference between professional red teaming and competition red teaming. And I'm going to leave that check discord for that but the, the important difference between it is to make sure competitions you are supposed to get caught and it's supposed to be mimi and it's not super intense whereas in real world you definitely do not want to get caught you want to be hidden you want to clear your, you want to like not show that you were even there at all you want to be absolutely hidden which is the big difference in my opinion i'm sure dan has opinions though check discord out if you want to see those uh okay i'm gonna say i rambled enough if anyone has questions, reach out to me on Discord, Workplace, uh, whatever means, RITSEC email, go for it, uh, social media. But yeah, thank you, everybody. Awesome. Thanks.